pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the Vietnam Veterans News Podcast. News of interest about Vietnam veterans from a Vietnam veteran. Now, here's your host, Mac Payne. This is Mac Payne here with episode 1691 of the Vietnam Veteran News Podcast. News about the Vietnam War and the brave veterans who served there, as told to you by yours truly, a Vietnam veteran. In this episode, I have special news for all subscribers and visitors to this podcast. A notable college professor by the name of Bob Rodriguez who teaches about Vietnam and the Vietnam War up at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, has agreed to come on to this podcast from time to time and tell us about different aspects of the entire Vietnam War experience, going all the way back to the year 40 A.D., telling us about the history of Vietnam to help Vietnam veterans and everyone else understand more about that country and why we were over there fighting in a war. This episode will be the inaugural program by Dr. Rodriguez. It will be followed by many more in the coming weeks, so that when he's finished, you will all be experts about the Vietnam War. So without any further ado, let's get started on Dr. Rodriguez's initial installment of his Vietnam history for this podcast, The Vietnam Veteran News. This is Mac Payne here. I have a very, very special guest on the podcast today. It is none other than Dr. Robert M. Rodriguez. I always like to say his name, Rodriguez, ends in an S because he is of Portuguese heritage. Most Latinos end the name in Z. So I always like to point that out because he is a special person. He's special because he teaches a class on the Vietnam War up at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He has graciously agreed to come on the podcast and devote some of his precious time to sharing some of the things that he teaches on the platform up there at Duquesne about the Vietnam War. And he goes into some really, really good details about things that many Vietnam veterans aren't that familiar with, especially in the beginning. In this episode here, he's going to talk about the beginning a little bit about Vietnamese history and culture, which when you know more about it, it makes some things that happened over there a little bit more understandable. Dr. Rodriguez, you said it was okay to call you Bob? Yes, it is. I know what a big deal it is to have a Ph.D. because my daughter got a Ph.D., so I know it's it's a significant thing, and I appreciate you letting me call you Bob. <laughs> Since this is the first time, why don't you just give a little bit of introduction to yourself, and then go ahead and tell us a little bit about the Vietnamese early history and culture. Hi, Mac. Uh, Thanks for bringing me on your your podcast. Uh, My name's Bob Rodriguez. Uh, I've lived in western Pennsylvania all my life. I've taught 48 years in the uh, public schools here, uh, high schools, and have taught at Duquesne University since 1990 as an adjunct professor, so for about 30 years there. I'm now retired from basic ed, so my focus now is on at the college level and also doing uh, what we call Vietnam symposiums. I do them in some high schools, but uh, I think our signature event, uh, it was at Duquesne University, and it just passed this uh, this past Wednesday, March 11th. We had eight Vietnam vets there, and it was, uh, it was, uh, it was very good. I, I think it went very well. But I thank you for bringing me on here, and I... And I like to start a little bit uh, how I start my course is I try to take the students back uh, into a little bit of Vietnamese history and not an in-depth but really kind of a a look at it because uh, it does reveal something about why the Vietnam War uh, was so tenacious for the United States and the Vietnamese between 19, let's say, 55 and 75. I'm going to use those dates, and we'll, we'll qualify that as we go along. I'd like to make one comment here that tied into that. 
I always noticed when I was over there that I was amazed at how the North Vietnamese had such a dedication to what they were doing. It's like they had no regard for life, the lives of their soldiers. They just would just continue coming. It's like they were so dedicated. I was just amazed how they could get that way. And it was, I'm just excited to hear about why they got that way. So uh, go ahead and tell us. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to go back about 2,000 years, which is a good early beginning. And we're actually going to go back to B.C. Uh, we're going to start around 207. Around 207 B.C., this is when the Chinese came into what we know as Vietnam. It was actually broken up into three provinces and later on was called Indochina, mostly because it was negating Vietnamese nationalism and referring it to as a uh, offspring of Indian and Chinese civilizations and culture. Okay, they subjected the Vietnamese to uh, cultural, uh, you know, th their cultural superiority. In 40 A.D., okay, we had uh, a, a quick revolution brought about by the Trung sisters. Now, the Trung sisters uh, were two women who led a revolt in 40 A.D. Now, it was short-lived. And they were ousted by 43. And this was against the uh, the Chinese dynasty that was controlling them. I believe it was the Ming. The Trung sisters were defeated when their fellow rebels uh, left them. And uh, they were eventually uh, captured by the Chinese and decapitated. Their heads were sent uh, into China, you know, as booty. Before we go back, I was just curious, those original people in Indochina, where did they come from? You can uh, go back over time. I mean, this was the spread of civilization. They, they, they emanated from the Middle East, okay, out. And then, of course, over thousands and thousands of years, the, the environment, the food that they ate, this took on ethnicity. Because the really the first history of any country is its geography. Uh, it, it determines, you know, how you build your homes and what food you grow and what uh, whether you're hunters or gatherers and so on. But the ethnic Vietnamese were distinct from the Chinese, but obviously there was a cousinry there over huge time, uh, way back. And because I think, you know, I mean, ultimately there's a cousin, I guess, between all of us. They separated themselves because the Chinese were very, very dominant of them. I think Ho Chi Minh said at one time uh, when he collaborated with the Chinese, he, he says it is, uh, let me just, if I get the quote right, it is um, better to smell Chinese shit than it is to eat French shit. <laughs> yeah. So in other words, <laughs> we'll collaborate with them for now. This was a kind of an animosity that grew over time. And Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia are all of what we would call Indochina. You could probably include Thailand in there uh, as well. When the French came in, they controlled Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, and they called that Indochina. They they denied the ethnicity, and they broke them into three provinces, which was uh, Tonkin, up around the Tonkin Gulf, Nam, which is the middle, and then Cochin, China, which was the, the far south around the Mekong Delta and all that. Take us back to the Trung sisters back in 40 A.D. I, that was exciting. Okay. Go back to the Trungs, <laughs> all right? <laughs> In 40 AD, the Trung sisters led a rebellion uh, against the Chinese. And the Trung sisters, uh, what, we, what we see here, I guess, a couple things. Number one, uh, Vietnam was a matriarchal society at the time. Many of the leaders were, were women. Uh, and this is even going to carry through when we get to the uh, American Vietnam War, because you're going to see a lot of women involved in the uh, structures of government. Uh, in North Vietnam and in South Vietnam. Uh, and then you're going to also see a lot of VC, the Viet Cong, and the NVA are going to be infiltrated by, by women soldiers. 
Uh, so, you know, the the woman had a uh, a stronger position, you might say, in this in the Vietnam culture than it had in some other societies. Now, the Trung sisters failed, and they were captured by the Chinese army, and they were decapitated. But to this day, the Trung sisters are held up as heroes. There is a special day in February. It's a national holiday in which they celebrate the Trung sisters. That in itself is an indication that, uh, you know, the Vietnamese hold up uh, rebels uh, and people who resist domination, or in this case, foreign domination. So the Trung sisters are represented with parades uh, and the ethnic parade, you know, with the dragons and, and, and all that. And they're usually uh, symbolically represented as two women or elephants, okay, because that's what they used in, in battle. Is there a name for that holiday? The yeah. Trung Sisters it's Holiday, a, okay. Yeah, it's a holiday uh, just in, you know, in honor of, of the Trung Sisters. After the Trung Sisters failed, for the next 500 years, there was a second Chinese domination. Now, this was uh, punctuated by a uh, rebellion led by Tru Yeo. Tru Yeo. And she was uh, referred to as the Vietnamese Joan of Arc. Uh, and she led uh, a rebellion, which was, you know, that didn't, didn't really take hold, but she led an army into the, uh, into the jungles, uh, and they fought uh, pretty uh, vociferously, very, pretty tediously. And eventually she was uh, uh, cornered and she drowned herself uh, rather than to be taken. Uh, but she is considered the Joan of Arc of, uh, the, of the Vietnamese. This Can you spell that name? Yes. Yeah. T-R-I-E-U first and then A-U. A-U. True E-U. True you. Okay. True. Okay, then the third uh, uh, Chinese domination was from roughly the 7th century to the 10th century. Uh, Again, the Vietnamese were subjugated to uh, Chinese control, and the Chinese tried to dampen their uh, their, uh, culture and to impose Chinese culture uh, on the the Vietnamese. Then there was a period uh, from actually 938 to 1009, uh, where there were some successful, the first real successful Vietnamese uh, rebellion, okay? And this was uh, led by No Kuen, and I could spell that. No is N-G-O, and Kuen is Q-U-Y-E-N. Okay, got it. Okay. And he, he led uh, the first successful Vietnamese uh, rebellion. So for the next uh, roughly 70 years, Vietnamese were in control of their own destination. So they had independence during that period. Yeah. Okay. Right. There was this little flick of, uh, of independence in there. And then um, from 1010 to about 1406, uh, there was just a split dynasties. There was a rivalries between the, the Vietnamese, but they were consistently being invaded by the Mongols. Okay, and this was the Kublai Khan Mongols of the 13th uh, and into the 14th century. So, you know, this was a really uh, tumultuous period uh, in their uh, in their history uh, because they had uh, almost like a civil war within. And then they had some outside uh, interference as well with the, uh, the, with the Mongols. And then in 1406, the Chinese came back. Okay, they came back and they continued to, to dominate uh, uh, Vietnam for about 20 years until they were, uh, Vietnam was led to a successful rebellion. This is probably their biggest hero of early times, other than Ho Chi Minh, etc. And his name is Li Loi. And that's uh, L-E, and then L-O-I. Okay. And he led a rebellion. It led to a divided period, but this was fairly successful, and it was successful for about 250 years. Uh, 
with the Vietnamese, uh, it wasn't really um, uh, consolidated. It was like in regions, okay? There were portions of the northern part, which was closer to China. Some of the provinces did not fall under this. So it was spotty, but it was nevertheless one of their you know, most successful uh, periods of independence. And uh, he is considered, Lee Loy is considered their... Um, one of their great heroes, you know, almost like a George Washington uh, of uh, uh, American fame. Uh, later on, during the Vietnam War with the United States, there was uh, a battle, a very significant battle fought at uh, Lam Song 719, and it was called Lam Song 719 because it was the birthplace of Lee Loy. And so, you know, it just shows how he, 600 later uh, is still very uh, was still very prominent in the minds of, of the Vietnamese people. But then in 1788, this is where the French came in, okay? Uh, and if you study Western civilization, this is when uh, nations began to imperialize, began to grab, gain colonies. As we know, the United States, uh, the colonies were a uh, part of imperialist England. At the time, they used us as uh, in, a, in a mercantile sense. Uh, so every nation, the dominant nations of Europe, were beginning to try to collect colonies worldwide uh, for two, uh, twofold purpose: one for resources, natural resources, and second for markets. You know, this is where we we'll we'll take your raw materials, we'll make them into finished goods, and we'll sell them back to you. So it was a you know a very uh, profitable situation for the so-called mother country. Uh, this coincides with the period of industrialization, you know, which, which kind of fits uh, as well. In 1859, this is when uh, Vietnam, or better known as Coach, uh, Indochina, okay, was, became a French colony. Okay? Uh, and this is when they, they began to institute governmental control strong governmental control over the uh, over the Vietnamese uh, and controlled their uh, economy, controlled their society. There was no military for the Vietnamese. They were pretty much uh, protected by the French. Uh, and this fit into the whole, uh, I guess, worldwide movement by the major nations to try to establish empires. One uh, question here. You say the French sure. came in, made their entrance in 1788, but they became a colony in 1859. So that period between sure. 1788, the French were just like there trading with the, or they just had a presence there, but they weren't running the place? Well, they had a presence there, but it was a little stronger than just um, trading. It's, it's called imperialism. And by imperialism is what you're doing is you're trying to force your culture on your, your subjects, okay? So what they began to do is bring in French schools, began to convert them to uh, Catholicism, uh, and tried to establish some you know, early businesses. Eventually, when we get up around 1900, I'll get as an example, uh, the Michelin Tire Company uh, was, was started in Vietnam because of the native rubber trees that were there. And, uh, you know, the French brought uh, the Michelin when the automobiles came into vogue, uh, they used the rubber plantations down there, rubber trees. They were actually uh, and used them for the Michelin tire. They really you know, uh, gave a shot in the arm to the Michelin tire. In 1859, the French formalized it and said, okay, we are now right. in charge here. Sure. Right, right. Uh, so this was uh, this goes up 1859 to about ni- to, to 1941. Because in 1941, this is when uh, Adolf Hitler invaded uh, France and uh, took over France from uh, June 1st to June 22nd in 1941. They just were like a hot knife going through butter. Uh, took over in, uh, in France and set up something called the Vichy government, which was a collaborative government. They collaborated with the, uh, with the Germans. Well, this gave the Japanese the, the notion that they could now move into Vietnam because the French were on their heels. And what 
the Japanese did not want uh, to happen in Vietnam was for the Chinese to move in there because nationalist China was uh, an enemy to Japan. You know, this was before uh, Chiang Kai-shek. It was uh, Sun Yat-sen. And I'm sorry, it was Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek. This was before Mao Zedong. Okay, and Mao Zedong was the you know the communist. Like, uh, they wanted to stop them from using the port city of Haiphong, uh, which is in the northern part of Vietnamese, and also a railway that was, uh, uh, that had been built down there by the, uh, by the French. So this was a, this was a military maneuver on the part of the, uh, on the part of Japanese. But what they also did, they stole rice from the, uh, Vietnamese peasants, and they shipped it back to China, or back to Japan, because in Japan, of course, you know, they were engaged in war, so commerce and, and agriculture was uh, at a minimum, uh, so this was a way of uh, feeding their, you know, their population to the detriment of the Vietnamese, and this brought in just uh, famine, wholesale famine, I mean, uh, they don't even have numbers of uh, Vietnamese who uh, died of starvation, in that period, particularly 1944-45, that was just a, a very dismal period. Uh, but now the, the Japanese are going to be in control. It's a military control, obviously, for, for four years. And then they fell uh, when they surrendered in August of uh, 1945. Uh, this signaled to the French. But the French were, again, they had been uh, unsteady in World War II, and had mostly been uh, a country um, in exile. They had established a, a government in London because the collaboratist government they felt did not represent, you know, the real wishes of French people. And and then uh, three fifths of France was actually attached to Germany. It was called Greater Germany. So now the French they're they're saying, well, we want to get back in here. Okay, we want to reestablish our colonial presence in uh, Vietnam and in other areas. Now, what what the French um, misanalyzed was the fact that there was uh, the changing uh, winds, you might say, uh, uh, worldwide. In other words, empires were dying. Uh, they found out in World War uh, II that, you know, when you had empires, you had to defend them, which extended your line of defense uh, and, and your own resources militarily. And it also became, it started becoming not as profitable uh, to own them. They were tougher to govern. They were becoming more restless, uh, et cetera. So when we look at the big picture, what we begin to see here is a period called the New nationalism or decolonization, meaning the breakup of empires. Now, the French, of course, they had been licking their wounds uh, in World War II, and they were uh, you know, embarrassed by the situation that they pretty much fought in exile. Uh, so they wanted to reclaim some of the grandeur of their uh, empire status. So this was a no-brainer to them. They were going to go back into uh, Vietnam and try to take over. Uh, the British were there to help them because the British, even though they were starting to give up their empire and would soon give up India two years later, they realized they had to prop France up. Okay? Because there's a little sidebar to this, and that is at the end of World War II, the Soviet Union began to expand all over Eastern Europe, all the way up to what we know as the Iron Curtain. Well, what lay on the other side of that Iron Curtain was a, a West, basically a West Germany and a prostrate France. See, so the fear was if we did not, if the Western societies did not prop up France uh, and allow them to continue their you know, colonial. Uh, designs, then they may fall, too, to communism. So uh, they came back in. Uh, the, the Japanese were, were driven out, but it wasn't that simple. Uh, the Vietnamese, they thought that they had been, uh, they were going to now be independent. And this is where Ho Chi Minh, in September, uh, 
1945. He comes back out of oh, decades of exile. He had been all around the world. He had been in France. He had uh, served as a busboy in the United States for a couple years, uh, in New York and in Boston. Uh, he was in the Soviet Union. He was in China. He was in Korea. He was uh, he was known by the Vietnamese people because of his writings on independence, and he was kind of almost the, the father of their uh, in the independence movement. Uh, but he comes back in, and on September the second, nineteen forty five, he declares uh, Vietnamese independence. Okay, and this, of course, is uh, in disagreement with what the French felt. Uh, what was interesting that day, on September the 2nd, in uh, 1945, it says he stood in front of a crowd of probably about 500,000 in Hanoi. And he began a speech with the words that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator by certain unalienable rights. He was actually... Uh, actually quoting from the Declaration of Independence. And uh, he had had uh, connections with American OSS officers, OSS Office of Strategic Strategies, which were the forerunner of the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. And uh, they had, you know, encouraged him. In fact, I think the United States, uh, the, the men on the ground, the people on the ground, wanted to support Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh had helped uh, downed American pilots in World War II. He and his in his group they would they would rescue them and, and save them from uh, the you know the Japanese. Uh, so there was a relationship that had been built there. And when he gave his speech again, as he quoted the Declaration, there were uh, there was an airplane that flew overhead, and everybody thought it was a weather uh, plane until the airplane tipped its wings. When they tipped its wings, it saw on the side of the airplane the United States of America. Uh, so that was almost like a salute to them. See? And I think a lot of the people, uh, the CIA people, the people on the ground, they felt that uh, Ho Chi Minh was in our back pocket, uh, that he was not so much a communist, he was more of a new nationalist. And that what he really wanted was an independence for his country. Okay, so that's where we sit in terms of uh, uh, now the beginning of. Uh, I, I'm sure you hear the, the phone. <laughs> it's just realism. <laughs> That'll be a good place to stop. But I just wanted to comment. You say there was a crowd of five hundred thousand people there in Hanoi, right, when the Japanese surrendered. Yeah. That's what they estimate. Uh, I've heard three to five hundred thousand, and you know you'll see different numbers. Nobody was really taking a tab or anything. And Ho Chi Minh was yeah. quoting our Declaration of Independence. Exactly. I think that's a good start up to it. That explains it. Next week, when we get into this, I'd like you to talk a little bit about how we treated Ho Chi Minh after that, and. That might help understand why he was so unhappy about the Americans being there later on. I believe that gives us a real good idea about the Vietnamese people and why they were so tough. And they stood up to us for all those years. That was great. I really appreciate it. And we'll talk to you later, and thank you very much. Okay, Mac, you too. Have a good weekend. Same to you. That is the first installment of Dr. Rodriguez's program on Vietnam history he will be presenting on this podcast. Hope you enjoyed it and you will join us for his next one, where he's going to be telling us about how we treated Ho Chi Minh after World War II ended and how that had serious consequences later on. This is Mac Payne closing out episode 1691 of the Vietnam Veteran News Podcast. Thank you so much for coming to listen to these stories and programs. You are cordially invited to return again soon and often for more that will be coming your way on this podcast, the Vietnam Veteran News. 
How about that? Ain't that a mess?